This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can tell your stories, express your opinion on the child welfare and family court system. Today I have a young lady on, a mother from the Detroit area, and before we go to that story, I want to, I want to show you some pictures of her children. Now don't this look like a happy family here? Well. Our mother is from the Detroit area, as I said, and uh, her name is Jonan Shia Lewis. And um, welcome to the show, Mrs. Lewis. Well, Mr. Lawrence, I thank you for letting me be on your show today. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm excited to get my story out. Now, CPS showed up here at your door September 7th of 2016. Uh, she saw your children through the door. Uh, you did not allow her in your home, but gave her an explanation to the allegations. And what were the allegations? On September the 7th, when CPS had showed up to my door with allegations, the allegations were of abandonment because when they called and asked me to take in my then delinquent 12 year old I told them no because of safety reasons and that wasn't accepted well she continued to stalk your home called the police to your home repeatedly without any evidence of abuse or neglect and without a court order each time could you tell our audience about some of the stalking Okay, um, one of the visits were in October. I was outside barbecuing with my children and the police showed up. And so they were like, ma'am, we need to see if you and the children and everyone is in the home is okay. I'm like, I didn't call the police, so who called? Well, we're not at liberty to say that, but we do need to take a look at you and the children. And so we came to the door and they were showing the flashlight in our face as if we had done something wrong. And that was one of the very first visits. It scared me and the children because we didn't know who called the police. And it was rather late in the evening, I would say between seven or eight. And then another visit was in November. It was actually two visits in November. The one that was that was most memorable to me was the one before Thanksgiving, was the one before Thanksgiving on November the 23rd. It was early and it was some banging on my door and me and my children were prepping for Thanksgiving dinner and I get to the door and it's the police, two DPD officers and two CPS workers. In fact, the very same CPS workers that had been coming since September. The police officer asked the CPS worker, why are we here? And, and I, I need to see the children. I need to see the children. So I explained to the police how many times this worker had been to my home and why she was at my home and why she was not given, being given what she was asked for, which was because she didn't have a warrant. The police walked away because there was nothing that they could do because there were no type of signs, nothing that would lead them to believe that my children were in danger. So they left without being able to accomplish anything that day. The very last time 
that the police came was in December when they removed my children. And that was after com com continuous visits, visits, and visits upon my home. Well, now it's uh, the day before Thanksgiving. And uh, CPS paid you the visit. The, the CPS lady paid you a visit that day, and you didn't let her see the children, feeling that you were being harassed. Um, now, December 5th comes along, around, and you received a text from the CPS lady telling you that you had to be in court in, in that afternoon. Tell us about that. Yes, I had an appointment that morning out in Southfield. I'm on the bus and don't have a car at this time. So I received a text message at my appointment telling me that there is child protective proceedings for my children in Detroit at the Lincoln Juvenile Hall at 1.30. And that's all it said. It didn't say that there was a petition being filed. It didn't explain anything except for that I needed to be there. The worker didn't even leave her name or anything like, you know, contact me. It was just there's proceedings for your children this afternoon and you need to be there. And that was it. And of course, I didn't think I was going to make it because I was all the way on the other side of town. Then I didn't have any documentation from myself because I didn't even know what the petition was stating at this time. So I tried to go home and get some documentation just to show that I had been taking care of my children and proof of their shots and everything being up to date because I didn't know what was being said. And so I got to the court. I was served with the petition at the court. Um, I was thrown an attorney who didn't know anything about me, who didn't want to hear anything about me. And I went into court blind. There was no one on my side at all. Now, didn't you say you had three referees? Yes. Once I requested my CPS report, I found out that there were three different referees that this particular worker went to. The first referee, her name was Brandy Jones. She went to that referee first. And that referee notified her that it was too late in the day. And since it wasn't any real proof of immediate need for them to be removed, she told her that she should just wait to file the petition. She went in front of referee Bobak, and he told her actually the same thing. He said, what proof do you have that there's an imminent risk of harm or danger to remove them? Because inside the report, it stated that she used my past CPS history. There were no new present allegations, but my past history. And he told her that, you know, unless she came with something else, there was no way he could grant an order for emergency removal. So this ended on December the 2nd. This is the day that she actually filed the petition. So she went back to court and tried to go in front of referee Bo back again and say, look, we really do need to get this emergency removal order and we need a knockdown door order. So inside the report, it said that referee Bo back told her he would contact his supervisor and get back with him. He took about three minutes and again, there was no need for immediate removal, so he did not grant the petition. She went, the very last referee that she went to was a Caucasian lady that was named Kathleen Allen. Kathleen Allen said that she, had I had a more positive attitude and cooperated with CPS from the beginning, I wouldn't be losing my children right now. And she granted the removal order. Now... Now, you were placed on the central registry. Can you tell us when you were placed on this registry? And I want to add to the audience also that you were expunged later that year on that registry. 
Can you tell us about that? I was placed on the central registry, according to my record, in January. I did not receive any type of notice or documentation that I was being placed on the central registry. That same report that I requested, that's when I found out that I was placed on the central registry in January. So upon me receiving my record, I emailed all of the Department of Health and Human Services involved with my CPS case from the worker, supervisor, section manager on up, and told them where was my documentation because I wanted to appeal this, seeing as though I was placed on the central registry by a worker and supervisor that never interviewed me or my husband. So how could you say that we should be placed on there? So we finally got our notices on April the 11th of 2017 after being placed on there January the 24th, 2017, and they did not even grant our request right away. We did not get, I didn't get my scheduled appointment until June, and it says in the law that they're supposed to take 15 days to get back with me and give me a date for my hearing. Well, they didn't. So when I did finally get my hearing, which was July the 19th, 2017 of this, this year, I was in front of the administrative law judge and the Department of Health and Human Services didn't bother to show up. So I was able to provide my proof to this law judge and show her the CPS record and she removed me. Now CPS, by them not showing up, they filed an appeal and said that it was a likelihood that I may abuse my kids and abandon them once they become teenagers. But the administrative law judge was not having it because they didn't show up and they did not provide a reason why. So as of August the 3rd, I was removed from the central registry for child abuse and neglect. So the folks at home can see here is a photo of the expungement paper. So you're no longer considered of child abuse, yet your children remain in foster care because the worker has a crystal ball and of course can, she thinks that maybe you could harm your children. Now you have some pics and some stories to tell us about the physical and mental abuse your children have endured in foster care? In the beginning when my children were removed, my two youngest boys, which are four and eight, were placed with my mother, and my other three children, which are 11, 10, and six, were placed with my sister. The children that were placed with my mother had been abused and police had been called to her residence more than once. And even though the foster care manual says that I'm supposed to be notified of any police involvement or any emergencies, I was never alerted that my eight-year-old had ran away and no one knew where he was for hours. And I was not told about that until he came back. Once I seen him at the visit, he told me that my mother was verbally abusing him, that she was cussing at him and calling him demons and accusing him of stealing. So when he was accused of being, he was basically secluded, not allowed to play and not allowed to do certain things. And my three-year-old, he was three at the time, he wandered out of the residence. How I found out is because East Point police found him wandering and because of one of my groups that I'm associated with on Facebook, they were looking for my son's family. They were not aware that he was in foster care or that he was placed with his grandmother because of alleged future abuse and neglect. So for hours, no one knew who he was, where his family was, or any of that. And I wasn't ever notified of that. I actually brought it to the attention of the state that I knew about it. So they removed him from my mother, but left my eight-year-old there and placed him 
with a family that I only know of as the Green family. Since my children have been placed there, my three-year-old has came to the visit, soggy with girl pull-ups. He's had numerous scratches. His ears are always filthy. He smells like urine. He complains of never getting water to drink. My eight-year-old that's also placed in that same residence, he complains of being thrown against the wall. As of last week, one of the children that's also in that placement struck him with a dog chain and had a hickey the size of an egg on the back of his head. I've called centralized intake three times to that home for the abuse that my children have suffered. They have not been removed from that placement, and the investigation is still ongoing. My 10-year-old -year son, he has complained of abuse, being hit and mistreated, having his things taken away, personal things that we give them. We bring them toys and objects from home just to make them comfortable as a punishment because the foster parent doesn't like me. She takes his belongings from him. She takes certain food that I sent home from him. And he was only moved yesterday. So they've been suffering abuse in these same placements for months with numerous CPS calls, and they haven't been removed. I would like you to tell us about your experience with the court appointed attorney? I was given two court appointed attorneys because the very first one was the day that I was served the petition when I received the text message. He didn't want to hear anything I had to say. He didn't want to see any documents. I had to prove that I had been out of trouble and not doing anything wrong. So I fired him. I was immediately given another attorney who did look over my documentation, but he wouldn't say anything. He didn't, like the, the worker said, she felt threatened. I wouldn't let her in my home. So how could you feel threatened if I didn't want to be alone with you for my own safety? He didn't fight that. And it was just her testimony, her hearsay testimony. He wouldn't object anything. He wouldn't do anything. So I wrote a grievance about him to the Attorney Grievance Commission. And on May the 30th, I went to court. That was supposed to be the second day of my trial. He called the court and quit. So I went in not even having an attorney to represent me. And so they wanted to postpone it again. And because we had been postponing since January the 25th, I told them that I would represent myself. Please get my children out of this emergency placement. And I wasn't, I did. They gave me another attorney as a quote unquote stand in. But he doesn't respond to any messages. I've called him, I've contacted him via Facebook just so he could explain to me the jury trial process and things. He has not returned a call, an email a Facebook message or anything. So with each attorney I've been given and charged $375 for from the state of Michigan, they have not done anything to help get my children home or to help me get this case closed. And I'll tell you, we hear about that all the time. These court appointed attorneys sitting there like a bump on a log, um, not representing their client, not cross-examining uh, the so-called evidence that CPS has. Uh, tell us where you're at with your case, would you? Well, my termination trial started January the 25th, and I had been attending that all the way up until May when I was offered from the referee to either go before a judge or a jury. And I thought that was something that you get offered in a pretrial or even at the initial phase of disposition. But now I'm back at the beginning again with a pretrial that's coming up this Friday and a jury trial supposed to be coming up in October and November. 
but they still, CPS and the Department of Health and Human Services have still failed to show what I've done to put these children in danger or at risk of any abuse or neglect. So I'm back at the pre-trial phase. I didn't know that you could start all over again, but I guess I'm the prime example that they can. Is there anything else that you might like to add? I would like to add that there is serious need for reform anytime you're guilty until proven innocent. My children were not forensically interviewed when they were removed, and that's also in my CPS report. They were removed in December, but they did not have an interview with an actual CPS worker until January. And even when they were interviewed, we were told by the CPS worker that interviewed them that they said they felt safe at home, that there were no safety concerns. And even within the CPS report itself, it says that my home was suitable, there was adequate sleeping arrangements, there was food in the refrigerator and freezer. She had nothing negative to say. So the things that would possibly bring a child into care for emergency removal was not what was going on. My home was suitable. I had all my homeschooling items visible and present. My home was clean. And then, like I told you, the children said and have said from the beginning, they were not abused or neglected. They cried every visit to come home. And these are things that are supposed to be reported to any judge or referee when you go to court. But the foster care workers that are involved with our children sit back and say nothing. They don't report how the visits are going. They're not forthcoming with documentation concerning school, medical. My three-year-old was taken to urgent care during his stay with these same predators. And I was not given documentation of why he was taken to urgent care until last week. And this was in June when he went. So the laws that the legislature set up for FOSTES are on a regular basis. And even though I have emailed our state reps, our senators, our Congress, the Department of Justice, the FBI, no one is doing anything to protect our children, and someone needs to do something. All of our families are not lying about what our children are suffering at the hands of our government for money. So I believe that any and everyone whose children are telling you they're being abused in foster care, report it and get it out so that your children can be rescued. Well, people, I'll tell you, this is uh, one of those heartbreaking stories that really tugs at my heart. Uh, this is also a very typical case that we see, not only here in Michigan, Michigan but across the nation. Uh, an endless supply, supply of tax dollars to go after children that were not abused. Meanwhile, the ones that are being abused are uh, let go and and eventually are murdered right in their homes. I want to wish Mrs. Lewis the best of luck with getting her children back. Um, and thank you for coming on our show. Okay. Thank you for having me on, Mr. Lawrence. I appreciate you letting me be heard and letting me get out what my children are going through, which is something they weren't going through at all. And the state of Michigan abuse continues after a couple weeks of this filming. I received a letter from Mrs. Lewis, and I want to read that to you. Today, Jordan was 30 minutes late to the visit. I wonder when that will be made up. Joshua smelled of urine and mildew. It also took four Q-tips to clean his ears, and his skin feels rough all over, like he has dirty, dry skin. When I was feeding Josea today, he was saying the most unusual things, as if he had been coached to repeat, repeat certain things. Jeremiah's clothes were dirty and smelled of mildew. His hair and ears were dirty, and he was musty. 
Jordan said he wasn't given deodorant, and that caused him to be musty. My husband and I are being charged for all of our children's care, and they are not being cared for at all. They are dirty, hungry, thirsty, needing baths, wanting to come home, missing their rooms, their beds, their clothes, and schools, cooking with me and doing yard work with their dad. They didn't need protection because they weren't being hurt or mistreated. That's why they were healthy. No marks or bruises caught uh, up on immunizations with medical waivers in place. No cavities and had a nice five bedroom home to live in. You know, it's really a shame they aren't living like that now. She, said, she continues to say, I am no longer on the central registry along with all the positive things described uh, above noted in the CPS report dated 9-6-2017. And she sent me the CPS report that said some very positive things about the family. Um, the MDHHS knew that I didn't abandon Charity Carter. They were pending criminal charges against me from her and a guardianship court order still in place. We want our children back and that is where they want to be as well. This is not in our children's best interest and, and certainly not because you can imagine not only the, the physical abuse they're going through but the mental abuse being away from their parents thinking that their parents had done something wrong. And, and in this case, they haven't. This is a good family here we're talking about. We're going to be back after these messages. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. I want to thank each and every one of you viewers for watching today. You can catch us next week, same time same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your voice can make the difference.